All right, hi, good morning. Um, I'm curious, how many of you are already pretty familiar with lipedema? All right, I'm not that surprised from this audience. <laughs> it's a special group here, but in the general population, it's a really under-recognized and underdiagnosed condition. I wouldn't be surprised if some of you have gone into a healthcare provider's office and asked about lipedema and they thought you were mispronouncing lymphedema. I get that a lot, um, but we're trying to change that. So uh, today I'm going to be talking about what lipedema is, uh, how it's diagnosed, what the types and stages of lipedema are, as well as some of the underlying drivers of the condition or the pathophysiology, and then some treatment options. So lipedema is an adipose tissue disorder or fat disorder that primarily affects the lower extremities. It can also affect the arms as well, and it tends to spare the hands and feet. It's often described as being painful, and, um, and it's, uh, these are a few of the driver, uh, the often d descriptions of the condition that you might see. Um, we don't really know how common the condition is. Some sources will call it a rare condition. However, those tend to be a little bit more dated now. Now that we're getting more knowledge about it, we find that it's much more common than we once thought. Dr. Foldy in Germany uh, estimates somewhere as high as 11% of women may have the condition. There is no specific test or lab, imaging, lab or imaging to diagnose lipedema. Uh, in fact, the diagnostic criteria from 1951 are still largely used today. It does occur almost exclusively in women. You m may see uh, a few men that have the condition, but it is incredibly rare. And some of these descriptions I've already described. However, uh, also easy bruising stands out as another one that is very common. There were some recommended additions by Dr. Karen Herbst, including these seen here. Uh, one of the ones she listed, number 10, how it is unaffected by caloric restriction, is uh, one of the other very, very common and striking aspects of the condition. There are different types of lipedema depending on what part of the legs are affected and if the arms are affected. You can have different combinations, so of course you could have both the arms and the legs affected. And there are different stages. Uh, stage one, there's little change in the texture uh, of the legs. It tends to be very smooth, uh, and then it progresses. In the later stages, it tends to have more severe lymphatic impairment. You see more outpouchings of the skin and tissue as well. And so I wanted to touch on a couple of the overlapping conditions. Lymphedema and lifestyle-induced obesity are commonly um, misdiagnoses that people with lipedema have, but they're also overlapping, so you could have all three simultaneously. These are a few of the differences between lipedema and lymphedema. One here that will stand out uh, clinically is that with uh, lymphedema, it's going to affect the feet, whereas lipedema, the feet are not affected. Uh, also, when you elevate the feet in lymphedema, there tends to be a change in size, whereas in lipedema, that doesn't happen. Uh, this, the size of the legs stay the same. Uh, but one estimate is that 15 to 17 percent of women that are being treated for lymphedema may also have lipedema. Lipedema versus lifestyle-induced obesity is seen here. Uh, so more than 50 percent of people that have lipedema also have lifestyle-induced obesity. With obesity, the weight that you lose is going to be lost more uniformly, whereas in lipedema, the affected fat tissue is not going to change as much. It's not going to respond as much to, um, to diet and lifestyle changes. Uh, 
So what are the underlying drivers of the condition? We are still learning a lot about this. We don't fully understand everything behind it, but we do know that there seems to be a uh, involvement of a sex hormone, particularly estrogen. Um, we know that for a few reasons, and this is being studied more, but it does occur exclusively in women, almost. The men that do have it tend to have higher estrogen states for one reason or another. It also tends to get worse when people are going through a hormonal change like puberty or menopause or childbirth. We know that there is some genetic uh, driver too. It tends to be more common in families. So even if it's not diagnosed in older generations, usually patients can say, oh, well, my mother had the same exact legs as me and probably had lipedema. <laughs> Um, and we also know there's both vascular and lymphatic impairment and inflammation uh, behind the condition. If you look at lipedema fat underneath a microscope, it looks different than normal fat. As you can see, there's a lot more fibrosis, a thicker septa between the cells. There's more debris between the cells as well. And there's a greater size variation in the cells themselves. I apologize for how busy this slide is going to be, <laughs> but um, this is a little schematic of kind of how we put these different ideas together. This is certainly going to change like anything in science as we learn more. But um, we, so as I mentioned, in the lower left-hand corner, we know that there is an estrogen uh, dysregulation, possibly with the receptors for estrogen in the fat tissue, uh, and this ends up leading to a growth in number and size of fat cells. When that happens, we get a release of free fatty acids. Free fatty acids are going to drive inflammation. We also know that there is a buildup of debris and uh, there are some uh, lymphatic changes. However, in earlier stages, it may be more that the lymphatic pump is being overwhelmed and not that there is severe damage of some sort to the lymphatic system that tends to come later on. With this inflammation and fibrosis, we get something called microangiopathy. And what that means is that these very small vessels get a much thicker cell wall or wall to the, uh, the vessels, and they become leakier. With that, you get more fluid or hydrostatic pressure happening and capillary fragility. When you have capillary fragility, you get symptoms like easy bruising and spider veins. So when you have impaired blood flow to the area, you're gonna have lower oxygen. You need those blood vessels to carry oxygen to those cells. And so when there isn't enough, you end up with a disrupted metabolism of each fat cell. And in some cases, they're gonna be damaged enough that they're going to die. So we often have felt cells dying in our body. That happens all the time. But this is happening at a higher rate. And so immune cells called macrophages come in and they end up creating more inflammation. This is all tied together because inflammation leads back to the growth of number and size of fat cells. Um, and there are these other connections that happen as well. To me, this gives a lot of different opportunities for where we can try to target treatments. The more we know about how it works, the more we can try to treat these underlying drivers. All right, so um, before I move on to treatments, this slide uh, highlights some of the common conditions that tend to happen with lipedema. Lymphedema, of course. Other hormonal imbalances, uh, imbalance and orthopedic problems, arthritis, mobility issues, joint hypermobility like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, um, fibromyalgia and hypothyroidism both happen at a higher rate with patients with lipedema. And you also have an increased risk for aortic stiffness. And so we just need to take all these things into account when we're uh, treating patients with lipedema and making sure that we're addressing all of these issues that might influence not only the condition, but their quality of life in general. Despite having an elevated BMI or body weight, you actually don't have higher risk for things like diabetes or cardiovascular disease or high blood pressure with lipedema. 
unless, of course, you have other reasons for that, like the lifestyle-induced obesity as well. Those risks do go up in later stages also, but um, not so much in early stages. Okay, so it's a, a complex condition that really requires a multifaceted treatment approach. My goals are fundamentally to stop the pro uh, progression of the condition and to improve quality of life, but there are lots of other things we can do on top of that. As a naturopathic doctor, I am looking to treat the whole person, addressing the foundations of health, which I'll go into in a minute, and treating those underlying causes and reducing the risk of those other and the impact of some of those other conditions. Okay, so foundations of health. These are sleep, nutrition, exercise, and mental health are to me some of the most important fundamental things that we need to be working on for any condition, but especially with conditions like lipedema and lymphedema. Sleep can really influence um, so many conditions. It can cause an increase in inflammation if you're not getting enough. And uh, just to highlight the impact of insufficient sleep, there was a study in 2017 uh, in JAMA that showed that insufficient sleep can l decrease your basal metabolic rate or the calories you burn at rest enough to lead to a 12 and a half pound weight gain per year. In lipedema, it's much harder to get the weight off. So if we can prevent that com from coming on from these underlying issues like sleep um, de um, deprivation or insufficient sleep, uh, then we should do that. Exercise and movement, of course, is, is important too. It can help reduce inflammation in the long term and improve lymphatic health. These are a few of the types of uh, exercise that have been studied in lipedema. Uh, if you can find an aquacycling place near you, I hear it is effective specifically in lipedema. Um, nutrition, I'm not going to go into too much detail because uh, Ch Chuck Ehrlich will be talking about this later on. However, there are certain dietary strategies that can be particularly helpful for lipedema. In general, an anti-inflammatory diet that's high in lots of uh, good, colorful fruits and vegetables, omega-3s, um, and low in things that are going to promote inflammation like sugar is pretty good for most people. And there are certain key nutrients you want to target too. Uh, there are certain ones like proanthocyanidins, which are found in the dark purple, blue, and red fruits and vegetables. Those have been shown to make positive effects, have positive effects on the microvasculature. And citrus bioflavonoids have also been studied and shown to reduce capillary fragility and edema. I also don't think mental health can be overlooked at all. People with lipedema have been struggling with this condition for most of their lives. And I, I see so many issues here where I, it's such a frustrating condition to have. And we need to make sure that we're addressing this aspect of a, of a patient's health. I'm not gonna go into these individually, uh, but just wanted to reiterate that we need to find ways to treat the, the cause, the underlying drivers, and we are still learning a lot about what this is, but if we can find ways to support these aspects of a patient's health um, in an, a way that's individual to them, then that's really important as well. I also refer out to a lot of different therapies. Some of these you, you all will be very familiar with because it's about supporting the lymphatic health. There are also some uh, studies in other types of therapies that have been uh, in lipedema specifically. Right now we only have smaller studies, but that's changing all the time. One study on vibrotherapy where it was a vibration technique was incorporated with manual lymphatic drainage showed some improvement in um, quality of life and leg volume over uh, MLD alone. And other th possibilities like quadrivus therapy have research being done on that as well. Currently that one is only available in the Netherlands, however I think that's going to be changing. And lastly, I just wanted to touch on some of the procedural treatments because I get asked about these frequently. Uh, liposuction is appropriate in some cases, and it has been shown to improve quality of life and reduced uh, pain, as well as, of course, the size of 
legs and, uh, and arms if that is affected. And it just needs to be done with somebody who is familiar with lipedema and is using techniques that have been shown to be effective specifically with lipedema, like tumescent liposuction or water-assisted liposuction. Um, studies on that show that the results last for at least eight years in many patients uh, and probably uh, beyond that as well. Cryolipolysis is uh, better known as cool sculpting is one of the uh, cryolipolysis techniques. Uh, I do not think this is an option for lipedema because it's intentionally damaging fat cells. It requires a functioning lymphatic system, which we know is a problem. And you are generally going to be treating uh, some larger areas uh, than is really treated with cryolipolysis. And bariatric surgery is only going to be effective if for the lifestyle-induced obesity and not for the lipedema itself. And I'll just leave you with those two organizations if you want to learn more about lipedema. Thank you.